and welcome everybody. We're so happy to see folks joining us and um, only have a couple of brief announcements. Um, Debbie, Debbie read my mind about <laughs> what I was going to announce. We do have the um, Eugene Christmas bird count um, report in the February issue of the quail, which will be out the 1st of February approximately. Um, we had a lot of um, data to crunch because the Christmas bird count wasn't until the 3rd of January. And so our deadline for the quail is usually the first of the month. So we, we were, were a little late, but I'm hoping it still gets into your um, either post office box or email inbox by the 1st of February. Um, also in that issue of the quail newsletter will be the results and report from the Cottage Grove count and the Oak Ridge count, um, both of which are also in Lane County. And um, so that's something that you can look forward to. We also have the results of the Eugene count um, for those that are interested posted on the website already. It's been there since about the 10th, I think of uh, January. Also, we are continuing to have uh, sort of controlled small group bird walks um, each month. The um, third Saturday bird walks led by Rebecca Waterman. Um, what we're doing now is people need to contact her either via phone or email and her information is on the website and in the newsletter um, to sign up uh, because we need to control the number of people coming out together. We also have to adhere to um, COVID-19 precautions so that people are no longer carpooling unless it's your own family unit and then um, wearing masks and not sharing optics during the walk. Um, so, and um, bringing hand sanitizer and whatever. But, but Rebecca is happy to, to lead some walks for small groups. She's been doing that through the last year, but um, we're, we're hoping this year, you know, eventually we'll be able to, to spread out and um, get together for, for more of those. So now I will uh, pass the discussion to Debbie, who's gonna give you a conservation report. Hi, I just wanted to say um, stay tuned. We're all waiting to see what regulations will be reversed. We've got a couple of um, encouraging things happening. There has now been a ban instituted, for example, on um, extraction in the Arctic. We're waiting to see if protection under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act will be reinstated, but it's um, there's a lot to look over, but the new administration has instructed their people to look over some of the regulation reversals and to see what is protective, what needs to be restored. So stay tuned um, to see what happens with that. But here um, in Oregon, um, many of you might be aware that the proposed um, Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas terminal and the connector pipeline um, had some troubling um, uh, get arounds, uh, particularly for water protection rules. And as a result, um, the permit to go ahead with that has been denied. So that just happened about a week or so ago. And many people who are concerned about the destruction of habitat um, are pretty happy to hear about that. So that's a little bit of a local report. And again, stay tuned. We're hoping that um, there's a lot more protection available for habitat, wildlife, and the birds. So I will turn it over to Dennis. Okay, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit, a little bit about next month's meeting. We're going to have uh, Bill Sullivan. Uh, Bill's been a regular speaker for us over the last several years. And this year he's going to be talking about a new book, uh, New Hikes in the Central Oregon Cascades. He was scheduled to give this uh, talk last year uh, and in March, I think it was, and we had to cancel that. And so uh, his book is still a new book, but it's a year older than it uh, would have been. But he's going to, there are several new hikes he's going to talk about, including some uh, new uh, bird refuge trail in Salem and several reopened trails uh, for wildflowers and things like that. It's really a good presentation. So that'll be next month. So be sure to uh, tune in for that. Uh, now for tonight, we have Rich Hoyer. A lot of people know Rich. Rich has been around here for a while. He was born in Corvallis, Oregon, and he went to school there also, getting degrees in German and zoology. Uh, he also has learned to speak Spanish and Portuguese and maybe some other languages that I'm not sure about. So uh, he's uh, very good in the language departments, including birds, apparently. So we're going to learn a lot about that. 
He's been an itinerant biologist and summer guide on St. Paul Island, Alaska. And he moved to Tucson, Arizona about 20, uh, for 23 years. He's been living back here in Eugene for a little bit over a year. Uh, in Tucson, and still, he's a, he, um, he's a professional birding tour leader with wings. And with wings, he's been leading tours in uh, amazing places, Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, Costa Rica, Mexico, Belize, and Jamaica. And he also annually uh, gives tours in Oregon, all through the uh, organization called Wings Birding Tours. Uh, he's an amazing person. He now lives here in Eugene. We're really happy to have him as uh, part of our own group here. And we're excited to have him talk to us tonight about bird mimicry. So um, take it over, Rich. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Dennis. Yes, I'm also very happy to be here in Eugene as well. Um, I'm enjoying my time back in Oregon. I missed the green and I missed this weather. <clears throat> so my, my uh, talk begins with a, a, a short quiz, a pop quiz. Uh, one of these sounds was actually uh, posted to the, the Audubon website. So some of you may have heard this. I'm, I, I'd be love to love to be able to ask you all <laughs> who listened to it and who figured it out, but uh, I'll just give you some time to think Clark's, about this. Clark's I'm Nutcracker. Oh, I got. I'm hearing somebody. Clark's Nutcracker. Close. Oh. It's also have a very similar sort of call. You get extra points if you name the bird that's in the background. <laughs> There are, there are five here. I think most people know what that one is. This is one that was on, the next one was on the, the Audubon website. Now a lot, of, a lot of people here would know <laughs> this. This bird is widespread across North America, but the subspecies here is the only one of the three groups that give that song. The white-breasted dunt hatch in the interior in North America and in Eastern North America does not have a song type, anything like that. And then everybody should know this one. But the real answer to the question, the quiz, is these are all made by a northern mockingbird. Uh, furthermore, they're all made by the same northern mockingbird. And one thing I want you to notice about this song, and I posted the sonogram in a movie-like format down below, as you can see, the mockingbird always repeats things, almost always in threes or fours, not always, but almost always. Um, sometimes it doesn't repeat. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. Is actually the call note of a white breasted dunt hatch. You might recognize that, but see how it repeats it. There's the flicker again. You won't hear that much around here. And then it doesn't always repeat things here at the very end, the single individual killed your notes. Another thing to notice about these mimic this mimicry is that it's it's not quite perfect. Oh, the background, you get extra bonus points if you that repeated tink tink in the background, you recognize that as California Cohe. Oh, I told you I was going upstairs to, to, to get so, so to demonstrate how they're not it's not quite perfect. I play the Northern Mockingbird version of the flicker and then I'll play the actual species afterwards. And you can hear there is a similarity very close, but they're not quite perfect. Here's that acorn woodpecker. What's, what I find interesting about that recording is how it speeds up and gains an in intensity, much like the actual species. There's the mockingbird doing the red shouldered hawk. There's a real red shouldered hawk. There's a western white breasted nut hatch song. They don't give it very often and only in the spring here. There's a great horned owl in the background. 
So I think almost everybody knows that Northern Mockingbird mimics, they don't mimic perfectly. Mockingbird means the bird that is mimicking, mocking, mimicking the same. They're also in the family Mimidae, which used to be called the mocking thrushes. We now know them as thrashers and mockingbirds. And it turns out that almost every member of this family mimics somewhat, maybe not quite as good as Northern Mockingbird, but one of the also very accomplished mimics in the thrasher family is the gray catbird. And one thing that's really interesting about this song is that it was recorded in California where catbird is not a breeding bird. It's a very rare vagrant, um, but occasionally one shows up there in the summertime and that's where Greg Budney recorded this one. And it's mimicking a lot of Western birds. And that is something I will uh, talk about a little bit later that can be interesting We learn about birds. The very first note rising and then getting sort of large, I think indicates it's a buzzy sound or a burry sound. That's the Western wood peewee. You may not catch all the other things that it's mimicking right off the bat, but you should be able to hear that Western wood peewee right at the very beginning. Well, this is definitely a Western gray catbird from somewhere near the Western edge of its range where it learned those calls. Um, some of those are very, very fast. The bush tick, for example, you wouldn't have picked up unless you heard this over and over again. It's those double two notes at about 11 and a half seconds. Um, and also great catbird incorporates a lot of non-mimicry in the song. Uh, sage thrasher, if you listen to the sage thrasher song, you probably won't hear much mimicry there. It's just fun to listen to nonstop babble. So computers have made the, a study of bird sound much, much easier. It's revolutionized them. You're able to look at these sonograms uh, with very simple free software that you can download and you can manipulate it, tease it apart. You can copy and paste just like any like word processing program. Uh, and that has actually made me able to give this talk uh, in a much better way than, I, than when I first gave it. Um, what I did for this stage thrash is I looked at the first seven seconds there and I cut and snipped out the several different elements. An element I mean by a section where there's a brief pause. The first element in this song is those first five sort of upside down V-like notes. The second element is that very next part. And the third element is the third one. And I snipped them out like that. That's just playing the first seven seconds. And so here are the elements that I pulled apart. Element one was that. To me, that sounds like it might be an American Robin mimicry. The second one, let me play that one again. It's hard to know for sure what that might be. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. Scold of a Robin. That one is probably Western Meadowlark. Now, some of these aren't very good. And the question might be maybe Sage Thrasher is not a very good mimic, but maybe it's not actually mimicking in this case, a Western metal arc, but it's mimicking it's, the model was maybe another Sage Thrasher that had mimicked a Western metal arc, or maybe several generations, kind of like the children's game of telephone where it just gets handed down and it changes a little bit by little bit each generation. Um, that's probably Northern Flicker. Again, not fantastic. Don't know what that one is. That might be too many generations apart from its original one. That's the slicker. Well, so how do we know it's not just accidentally making sounds that sound like those other things? There's only a limited variety of sounds a bird can make after all. Well, there's some funny examples here where there are birds that have been caught doing that. Well, where I have caught birds doing that. White-tailed kite sounding like an epaulet oriole. Now those both do occur in South America, but they're in very different habitats. Or how about Rondonia versus Woodcreeper long-tailed broadbill, which occur on different continents, street flycatcher and African goshawk. Now there are stories behind each of these. The white-tailed kite, I was with, with um, Taylor Brooks, who has the most robot-like recall of bird sound of anybody I know. She was 22 years old when we were both guiding together at Cristalino Jungle Lodge for two months. She had never been to Brazil. It was her very first day there. 
and this call note over the deep rainforest and a dark jungle trail called, and she said, white-tailed kite. And I said, what? And she, I heard it, I didn't know what it was. It's this chip note up high in the trees. And we figured it must've been flying over. She pulled out her iPod, played white-tailed kite. It was a perfect match. We shrugged. There were some pastures within a few miles where there might've been white-tailed kite, but why would it be flying over the rainforest? So a week later, I heard the actual call note in the gardens of the, the lodge and determined that it was actually an epaulet oriole. So here's the kite. And that's the epaulet oriole. So there was not a surprise, but it was just stunning that she was able to call that white-tailed kite call out in the rainforest with zero context. And it does sound like epaulet oriole. But that's the only time that I think she ever made a mistake. Here's Rondonia Woodpecker. And that was a recording I made, never saw the bird high in the trees. And I played it to my friend, Dave Stayskull, who had birded in, in South America a bit. And he, he said he recognized it, he would think about it. We were on a long drive. I played it again for him 20 minutes later. He said, play it again. He says, got it, long-tailed broadbill, which he knew from Borneo. Very similar. And then this last one, Street Flycatcher, I hear a lot on my tours in Central and South America. It's a very familiar call. And exactly two years ago, I was visiting friends in Eswatini. You may have heard of it as Swaziland in the past. And I stepped out the front door and I heard what I swear was a street flycatcher. I finally found it and it was an African goshawk. So here's street flycatcher, an African goshawk. So how do we know that these are not mimicry? Well, there was different continents, but this tool using sonograms is super helpful. Look, the shapes of them reveal a lot more information because it happens over such a short time frame. White-tailed kites so, uh, notes are reverse J-shaped. Epaulet oriole is simply a straight down, slightly edge to the right. That, that long sort of horizontal blur you see to the right is actually an echo. And here's the rondonia or hondonia woodpeeper, as they say, versus long-tailed broadbill. Extremely similar pitch as well as delivery, but note the long-tailed broadbill has those overtones, those harmonics above. And if you look closely at the individual note shapes, they drop suddenly, but the shape is quite a bit different. And same with the street flycatcher. It's just an upslurred note and the African goshawk note is actually V-shaped. So here's the sage thrasher. Let me play that again. Element nine out of the sage thrasher. How do we know that's mimicry? Well, we look at the sonogram of its model, Western Meadowlark. They don't only sound the same, but they look the same. They're the same pitches, they have the same overtones. And furthermore, both of these birds are both very common breeding side by side. So that's the sage thrasher, sage thrasher, and the Western Meadowlark. The sage thrasher is a bit hoarse. Again, maybe it learned it from its parents or its grandparents. So if you got the, uh, other quiz, um, congratulations if you guessed the species. Um, unless you downloaded the sound and analyzed it, you wouldn't have been able to answer the second questions. So that was a trick question. Um, but it's lesser goldfinch. And lesser goldfinch have long been known to be excellent mimics. Um, but it's surprising how much mimicry has been overlooked in bird songs. And I'll give some more examples later on in the talk. But the most glaring example of this being overlooked is this paper that specifically discussed the songs of American goldfinch, lesser goldfinch, and Lawrence's goldfinch, a very prominent paper in a peer-reviewed journal. And specifically towards the end of this paragraph, she explains that these goldfinches have the most complex songs, very pastoring songs of the entire order of pastoring birds, except birds that mimic might have more complex songs. In other words, she's saying these birds do not mimic. Well, in this 22nd example of a lesser goldfinch, it mimics at least 17 times and you tease apart each and every note and it's just a constant, constant babble of mimicry that's so fast, you can't actually name or even think them as fast as the bird is actually mimicking. By the time you think, oh, it's just done violet green swallow, it's gone on and mimic three more.
So one of the questions is, who is the best mimic? Who's the most beautiful mimic? Who mimics birds the actual best? Well, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, this bird is obviously much more uh, capable than, say, a mockingbird. Many more birds in a shorter period of, of time. Um, but an even better one is the Lawrence's goldfinch. In the same, in the same 20 second, random 20 second, I just snipped 20 seconds out of the song. I found this one did 27, 28 different birds back to back. And what's interesting about Lawrence's goldfinch and lesser goldfinch is they intersperse their own sounds in amongst them and they also mimic each other quite well. So you hear lesser goldfinches mimic Lawrence's where they co-occur and Lawrence's mimicking lesser's. My friend Sharon Goldwasser did her thesis studying the lesser goldfinch mimicry in Arizona, her master's thesis back in the 1980s. Um, and some interesting things she noted was that goldfinches will not mimic things that have a low frequency in their song because they can't make that. They're limited by the actual physical structure of their own tiny little syrinx. So they don't mimic um, morning doves, for example. And then there was this paper in Western Birds in the early 80s where they pointed out, actually this is where I found Cooley's paper, they sort of pointed fun at her for not having uh, noticed that uh, Lesser and Lawrence's goldfinches do a lot of mimicry. And in their paper, they went and listed how varied Lawrence's goldfinches uh, mimicry is and they named a whole list of species that they could find. And they also specifically made exactly the same mistake that Ellen made and mentioned that that pine siskin contains no appropriated material. Pine siskins do not mimic. And the moment I read this, I thought, wait a second. When I was in college in Corvallis, I had pine siskins in my background that babbled on and on. And they did Violet Green Swallow and Evening Grow Speak in their songs. And I found this good example of a recording from New York. Not, I don't know the bir Eastern bird songs very well. So I had some help trying to figure out what some of these things were. Listen to this mimicry. Lots of pine siskin sounds in the middle of all that. You'll hear the juncos. Junkinlet song. Good robin in there. So one of the ones I didn't recognize was tree sparrow. I, I sent it out to friends. I go, oh, that's, that's definitely tree sparrow. Very good. This one I wasn't sure. Um, Taylor Brooks has suggested it might be Marshall. And it might very well be Eastern marsh wren, very unlike our Western marsh wrens. But finches, a lot of finches are excellent mimics. Purple finch was actually the very first bird that I heard mimicking at Finley. It was doing a sub song. Now a lot of birds will mimic in a second kind of song that includes just about a lot of babble. Nobody knows exactly why they're doing it. They do it quietly. They may not be actually communicating with other birds in this kind of song. But what purple finches do in their loud song is they often append at the very end of their song American robin or something else very common in their area. And Cassin's finches do the same. So in the sonogram, those last two upside down V-like notes, it's a very fast song. This is only two seconds long. You'll hear the two quick, quick notes of American robin. And this Cassin's finch song, the very last two are very clear American robin in the Greek. So this, their whole song isn't mimicry, they're just sort of adding a little bit onto it. And Fox Sparrow does exactly the same thing. It'll sometimes interject a bit of mimicry in the middle of its song or at the very end. And it's very, very often American Robin, often Flicker, and it might be something else that's common in its area. What's really interesting about Fox Sparrow is that there are recording examples from all across North America that show it mimicking Robin at the end. This one does a Robin and Flicker. These are both from California, and even Alaska, even Maryland. And there's a one little sound at the very end there that sounds surprisingly like the call note of Townsend Solitaire, but a, a, so, a fox sparrow in Frederick County, Maryland should not have ever heard a Townsend Solitaire, so I'm not sure what that is. There's a lot of other birds that mimic. You'd be surprised. Hooded Oriole has a type of song that's a constant battle of mimicry. I 
I don't have an example of, of Bullock's oil doing mimicry, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least if they occasionally do it. I was surprised listening to Sounds in Solitaire once that I thought I heard a bit of, of Kasson's Vireo or Western Tanager in there. So I found this Townsend Solitaire song in my sound library and listened to it. And sure enough, I was able to pull out Kasson's Finch and Western Tanager. Listen to this amazing song, 21 seconds long. I'm only hearing the first half of some of these. Well, there was a, an issue in some other Zoom talk I had where some people weren't able to hear any sound at all. I haven't heard any comments, um, but it was something that they had to fix on their own side. Anyway, so there's the Cassens video that's snipped out of that very song. And you can see there with the time at the top that it's at just 5.7 seconds, more or less. And there was the Western Tanager. Let me play those again. Oh, I can't go past this, let's see. Nope, yes I can. Here's the Cassens Finch, a Cassens Vireo. And here's a Western Tanager. Those are snipped out. Oh, and there's also a Pine Siskin that I found. So you might be able to listen for these. Actually, if you, I can see my pointer. 5.7 seconds is a Cassens Vireo. That's right down here. That's this little snippet right here. See 5.7 seconds. This snippet right here is Casson's Vireo. Western Tanager at eight and a half seconds. So that little sound right there spread apart looks like that. And then Pine Siskin listened for it over here. But after, <laughs> when I listened to this song a little more carefully, what I discovered was that every single last note in this entire song is mimicry. That surprised me. There's American Robin in there. There's Red Crossbill, there's Cassin's Finch, uh, over and over and over again. There's nothing in there that's actually a true Townsend Solitaire sound. So a Townsend Solitaire has a, has a type of song that is pure mimicry and that is not published. Uh, there's one recent guide to the bird song of North America, Western North America by Nathan Peeplo. And it's the most authoritative work on bird song in Western North America. And he did a lot of research and he mentioned that sometimes Solitaires will mimic. So as I play this, listen for the Cassin's Vireo down here at 5.7 seconds, the Western Tanager, and then the Pine Siskin. Really fast. Ready for the Pine Siskin, it's just up here. You have to hear very fast. Another one I discovered while researching for this, this talk uh, is Lark Sparrow's song is mimicry, half mimicry, half mimicry. This is a, a quote from the Birds of North America species account where they don't mention any mimicry and they did a lot of research. But there are two more recent works that have been published about Lark Sparrow's song, one in Western birds that used uh, techniques of analysis um, and statistics that were way over my head, and they failed to notice that half of the song is mimicry. I'll forgive you, you didn't hear the mimicry in that song, but let me point out in this sonogram that this is mimicry, and this is a buzz. This is mimicry, and this is buzz. This is mimicry, this is a buzz. This is mimicry, this is a buzz, and this is mimicry. So Lark Sparrow has these Lark Sparrow buzzes interspersed with mimicry. This very first one I want you to listen to. I wonder how many people knew what that was. There it is again. You gotta hear it very fast. And the normal, the model does not give it like that. The model repeats it. So I copied those two, pasted them again and again in a new sound file, and I got this. That might be a little clearer to some of you that that is American Kestrel. So that's just a few things that Lark Sparrow mimics. Um, the second element that it mimics, this rising note. People recognize that. 
So here's the Lark Sparrow at the top. And at the bottom, here's the model I think that it's mimicking. Here's Lark Sparrow. And here, that's the snipped out of that same song. And here's the model. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you heard that was a Swainson's thrush. So for up until now, I've been talking about birds that mimic more or less on purpose. They incorporate other bird songs or parts of their songs into their own song on purpose. It's not always the case. If you have any experience birding in the East, you might recognize this song. A friend of mine recorded this. He sent it to me. He said he couldn't believe what he saw. He saw an Eastern towhee giving this song, and that is a song of a Carolina wren. So sometimes birds mimic by accident. They learn the wrong song, and there are lots and lots of examples, people hearing warblers singing the wrong thing. Uh, my friend Eric DeFonzo recorded a fox sparrow singing that. It's a perfect California towhee song. Another friend of mine, I don't have the recording of this, uh, Chris McCready has a video. There's the, the link. You can actually probably search it of a, of a green-tailed towhee doing a perfect spotted towhee song. It learned the wrong song. I was leading a tour in, in New England with Paul Lehman for Wings once, and we were looking for uh, Cape May Warbler. And I radioed him and his half of the group that we had one, come get us, come quick. It was responding to my song. I played Cape May. It sang back. It got closer and closer and influenced American Red Start, and it sang a perfect Cape May Warbler song. Another time, I was leading a field trip for Tucson Audubon Society, and we heard a perfect Dick Sissel singing, which is an exciting bird in Arizona. And this indigo bunting popped up, opened its mouth, and sang a perfect Dick Sissel song. So, what happened in each of these cases? The bird's normal model for learning to sing would have been its father or a nearby male of the same species and for some reason there weren't any and the chicks in the nest or the juveniles in the crucial learning phase so a lot of these birds learn their songs only during a very certain time heard the wrong species and that's what they learned to mimic other species that i've heard mimicking now this whole talk is about birds in the new world when we when we get into the old world uh, europe asia and africa there's other extreme examples of mimicry i won't get into it, it was a, be an all night long talk and it would be another four years of my life of research. Um, but of birds that occur here in North America, house sparrow is not known to mimic. It's not in the literature that it mimics, but I have heard at least three house sparrows maybe accidentally incorporating an element into their song. I don't know if many people realize that house sparrows have a song. Um, when you hear them sing, they go chirp, chirp, treat, chirp, chirp, treat it's just this repeated over and over and over again that's the male's song and one time i heard that final note being a scrub jay another time i heard it doing a verdon this is in arizona and i had one in my backyard in in tucson that would mimic um cockatiel and then also not a new world bird but just for fun i had to include starling starlings are members of the mina family or i should say minas are members of the starling family a lot of which are known to be excellent mimics. What's amazing about the starling is, is one, its fidelity. So it sounds so much like its models, it actually fools you. Uh, I have been fooled by starlings in my backyard here doing bald eagle. Um, and they also can sing mimic sounds two at the same time, at least two. They're probably operating their syrinx halves separately. So you'll see in, as I play this, this example where it'll do, uh, Robin and crow at the same time, for example. Um, it's mostly mimicking two things at the same time. It's quite astonishing. That was the hawk and the robin. A lot of starling sounds mixed with your too.
There's no sound with this scrolling. Maybe if people turned off their video, we'd have more band. Okay. Is Alan the only one who can't hear that? Mm. No. no I, I can't. More of us that can only hear part of it sometimes. Yeah. Weird. Says I am screen sharing. That it part of it comes in, part of it doesn't. I think we've got too many videos on, so I we don't need video. So Just other people stop their videos. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Turn off your video. Oh, so everybody should turn their video off. When you when you yes. share, did you optimize for sound? There's a little button at the bottom of Zoom that allows you to optimize sound. I don't know if that'll make a difference. And I have optimized for video clip. Oh. So this is the next one. Let's just um, try it now. This is fun. Little lamb. Is that better? A little better. I didn't, I didn't hear greater yellow legs or lamb, and it's very soft now. It started skipping right around Brewer's Bar. Yeah, maybe if everybody turns their sound up too. Well, I have no choice but to continue here. Um, one of the, some of the fun things we can learn from listening to birds that mimic is where they have spent their lives. So this yellow-breasted chud I recorded in southeastern Arizona, and in its mimicry it incorporates uh, some ferruginous pig meal, which doesn't occur in that part of Arizona, but is a very common bird further south where yellow-breasted chats spend their winter. So this is, a, is the owl, the next element. There, that's Virginia's pygmy. Do it again. And then there was this northern mockingbird that I found at fields one year, about 20 years ago. It was singing. Where northern mockingbirds are not a common bird. Um, they've become a little more common in that area, but it was sitting there on a, on a power pole and it was babbling away and incorporated scrub jay, um, acorn woodpecker, was a surprising thing to hear out there, and magpie in its mimicry. Then I got to thinking like, where did this bird learn all of these? So I drew these range maps. This is where northern mockingbird is a most regular breeder, although it occasionally breeds all throughout that area of southeastern Oregon and Northern California. These are the areas where it's a common breeder, regular breeder. Here's the range map of black-billed magpie, and there's a star showing fields where I had this bird. And I overlapped all these range maps. California scrub jay is now actually much more widespread in northeastern Oregon into the Boise area, and acorn woodpecker. And when you overlap all those range maps, there's only two spots. <laughs> where those four species occur together. And I figured most likely this bird had grown up in the Reno area and that's where it learned all those four. However, it's also possible that it wasn't mimicking black-billed magpie, but yellow-billed magpie, in which case it could have come from the Sacramento Valley of California. Then there was this wide-eyed vireo, which was a bird on the rare bird alert in Southeastern Arizona uh, over at Portal in Dave Jasper's yard one year. And I got this recording of this bird. Uh, vireos have amazing songs and I'm gonna give some more examples later. But white-eyed vireo is known to be a, a mimic. It basically punctuates its song with a call note of one or two or three species, usually at the beginning or the end of each song phrase. And on the sonogram, you can see 
there's a song phrase and a long pause then a song phrase and a pause that's similar to a lot of videos that do that. The first two you'll see here begin with that sharp note, that's a ladder back woodpecker. And the third one I believe begins with a mock mockingbird. So I'll just start playing this. Oh. That very first note is ladder back woodpecker. Not every song phrase includes mimicry. And then it does this sort of babbling. Summer tanager in there. Now one second into this next phrase was the key. There. So I'm gonna go back to that phrase that starts at 25 seconds, snipped it out because there was a sound in there that said, that told me where this bird might have come from because it was mimicking a lot of ladderback woodpecker, mockingbird and summer tanager. Those birds all occur commonly in Southeastern Arizona. So that didn't tell us anything. So I'll play, play that phrase. It's right there at about one second, those six descending notes. Hear that? I'll play it again. That one, that brr, brr. Now down there at the bottom, that's the white eyed vireo. Here's the model at the top. It's Carolina wren. So if you add those up together, Carolina wren, ladderback, woodpecker, white-eyed vireo, just like I did with the, the Northern Mockingbird that takes you to Texas. So this bird grew up in Texas. It probably wintered in Mexico and in its spring migration, just veered a little bit too far west and made it to Southeastern Arizona. Now the Phanopeplas has two completely separate song types. It has a song type that has no mimicry at all. And that's the one I'll play now. Listen for this down in Medford. But this, the same bird was recorded doing its mimicry song, which they do quite frequently in Southern Arizona. Um, they're known to be very interesting migrants, altitudinal migrants, but their mov mov movements are not well understood where they are. But what's very revealing about all the birds that this bird is mimicry, mimicking is that it did not spend its entire life in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, but likely spent quite a bit of time in Mexico. Many of these birds do not occur anywhere near Oregon Pipe. And then I'm going to get into a little bit deeper into the theories of mimicry, the studying of mimicry um, and the reasons bird mimic. So back in 1979, Dobkin tried to categorize ways that reasons that birds mimic. Uh, he used the term copying as the umbrella term and everything else was either appropriation, imitation, this convergence or non-divergence in mimicry. And it gets really complicated and hard to understand in some cases but uh, as it turns out that I think the amount of mimicry and the reason birds do it and how they do it is so complex, you cannot fit it into just four categories. And as far as I know, anybody studying mimicry in birds these days doesn't limit themselves to these four definitions that he created. So it was a, it was a valid attempt, um, but everything I have discussed until now, whether the birds are doing it accidentally or on purpose, would fall under that first one, vocal appropriation, where they're just borrowing sounds from their environment and they're not trying to fool those other birds. They're actually singing in their song to attract a mate or to defend their territory. But what's interesting about the Phanopeplus mimicry is it has another kind of mimicry that has been documented. When Phanopeplus are pulled out of mist nets by bird, birders doing banding, uh, a phenopepla will emit a whole series of alarm calls of other birds while the person is actually holding it. And thick-billed vireos in South America have been also observed doing something very similar when a predator is near their nest. They will mimic the alarm calls of other birds in the area 
and the idea is that they might be actually doing this to fool the predator that there are other birds in the area you better leave otherwise you're going to have a whole lot of birds attacking you and that might be what the phenopepla is trying to do when you take it out of the net it's probably trying to say i'm a whole bunch of birds around here and i'm we're all going to hit you if you don't leave me alone and then there's this other kind of mimicry which is even deeper into it called vocal uh, vocal matching and a, the best example I have is this Jamaican vireo, but our Hutton's vireo also does something very similar. And this is a type of mimicry where a bird is not just incorporating something else into their song mindlessly, they're actually purposely in that moment mimicking that sound in response to something that they're seeing or hearing. Now in the case of Jamaican vireo, it's a very common bird in Jamaica. It has an ex extraordinarily diverse variety of songs. Uh, song types. If I'm ever walking in Jamaica leading a tour there and I hear something I've never heard before, it's a Jamaican vireo. There's not a huge amount of diversity on the island. Um, I don't know how many individual song types one bird can have, but I give you five examples in this and you can see the sort of like cut and paste here. Um, one, two, three, four song types. And then the fifth song type is the vocal matching where a bird is singing, who knows, song type 24 in its repertoire and its neighbor in the background copies it. The neighbor could be singing one of his 24 or 30 different song types randomly, but they don't. If they want to engage their neighbor and say, I'm over here, I hear you, they will match his song type. So listen to these four examples just to show you how varied they can be and then how this vocal matching happens. <laughs> Foreground bird, background bird. And Hutton's Vireo does the same thing. Hutton's Vireo's individual song phrases aren't as compl complex as Jamaican Vireo's. If, if you know our local ones, they either do tree, 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 or you hear a cheer. Cheer, cheer. They may have as many song types as Jamaican vireo. They're just not quite as complex, so we don't see them as being as variable. But it's not uncommon to hear a neighboring Hutton's vireo giving that exact same song type at the same time. I think I've discovered the same thing in Rufus Wing Sparrow, which isn't quite as variable, but they have a, a song that begins with one, usually one or two, sometimes three notes, and then the trill at the end is one of various kinds of trills. It could be a fast or a slow trill or a bouncing ball. So with those different combinations, a single bird can have maybe eight or nine or more different song types that it'll give throughout the course of the day. And here's an example of one singing its song and its neighbor singing the exact same song type right after that. <laughs> So an area of further research, if somebody wants to study vocal matching in song sparrows, I mean in sparrows. Then there's the jays, which is even a deeper level of intelligence and mimicry where they actually mimic something they're seeing at the very time. So this is Stellar's jay. Everybody knows that Stellar's jay um, can do hawks, but there's quite a bit of evidence. They're not just mimicking a hawk randomly. They're doing it when they actually see the hawk. So there's a Stellar's jay doing a red-tailed hawk. A Canada jay, even more so, um, when I'm looking for a uh, pig meow in Oregon on my tours and I hear a pig meow, I don't jump out and say pig meow because it might just be a Canada jay mimicking me mimicking a pig meow. And they're not doing it randomly, they're doing it because they heard me mimicking a pig meow. But I was leading a tour in Northeastern Oregon one year and that same thing happened. And sure enough, I just kept whistling. The jays came in and then one did a perfect Cooper's Hawk imitation which I'd never heard before. And I looked up and there's a Cooper's Hawk flying over. I was, I was blown away. So here's an example of Canada Jay doing a goshawk, like a real goshawk. So they'll mimic any, any raptor. They don't just mimic little birds. They only do those raptors. It's obviously something to do with their high intelligence and, the, and they're using that to fool other things. Even crazier mimicry. Now this isn't vocal mimicry here. At this is what I'm talking about. I'm getting even deeper into theorizing about evolution and the purposes of mimicry. The fact that Hutton's Vireo looks like a ruby crowned kinglet, 
It's obviously not doing that on purpose. It's evolved to look like a Hutton's Vireo, a Hutton's Vireo does, but it may actually be evolving to look like a ruby crown kinglet. And this is a theory called social dominance, where it might be an advantage for a Hutton's Vireo to look like a ruby crown kinglet, but it gets even crazier when you look at dwarf Vireo in Mexico is even more ruby crown kinglet-like. I have actually looked at a dwarf Vireo through my binoculars in the field and called it a ruby crowned kinglet. They even have a call note that is like a ruby crowned kinglet, which is scary. Not their song, but they're, they're, they're legit, just like a ruby crowned kinglet. And even more bizarre is this thing. There, come on, there are no yellow Vireos, right? Well, there is one yellow Vireo and it's shaped like and acts like a Wilson's warbler, which winters with golden Vireo. And golden Vireo has a call note that sounds like the nasal chimp of a Wilson's warbler. So there's something really weird going on here with this, that's a, a very ripe area for research. And so far I've been talking about songbirds and furthermore, just half of the songbirds are the, the, the Ossine passerines. Those are the birds that learn their vocalizations. Those are the only birds that mimic among passerines. If you look at the sub Ossines, the more primitive ones, the only ones we have here in North America are the uh, um, tyrant flycatchers but in Central and South America, you have the ant birds and Katingas and stuff. None of them mimic because none of them learn their songs. But there are two other orders of birds, of all these others, like and there's ducks and chicken-like things and mouse birds and pelicans. None of those birds learn their vocalizations. The only birds that learn vocalizations are in the Caprimulgaformes, and specifically hummingbirds learn their songs, and parrots. Everybody knows that parrots are excellent mimics, and I'm not getting to that. Parrots seem to only mimic parrots, wild parrots, and their own species, furthermore. And then the pastorines. Um, an example of hummingbirds that mimic is, is just a scaly-breasted hummingbird. It's a very common bird in much of Costa Rica, and it incorporates call notes of things like common toady flycatcher in its song. This particular recording I made um, has a lot of yellow, yellow warbler call notes. Those first three notes, for example, but a lot of them are yellow warbler. And in Arizona, there was a famous example of a hybrid violet crowned broad-billed hummingbird that spent three years at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. A lot of people went to see it, took photographs. It's all over eBird. Um, it was there for three years. It's a beautiful hummingbird. And Neither of those birds is very common. In fact, violet crown hummingbird is quite rare there. And this bird did its very best to sing an Anna's hummingbird song while it lived there. And then just for the fun of it, we'll go south of the border to a couple of the areas where I have led several tours. Because once you get into the tropics, there's a whole bunch of mimicry going on and it's too many examples to give. I'll just give a very few and, and then wrap it up. Cristalino Jungle Lodge is one of my favorite places to go. I've spent a couple of years of my life there uh, as a local guide and taking groups there. I had my 50th birthday celebration there a year ago. It was fantastic. Um, amazing things to be learning there. Yellow rump caciques when they're singing at their songs are a lot of fun. They like to mimic really raucous things like parrots. They sit on their nests while they do this. Cristalino has these amazing towers, which rise, freestanding towers rise above the highest trees in the forest. So they're 50 meters tall. The trees there aren't as tall as the redwoods. Um, but they're about 45 meters tall. And up there you see an amazing variety of birds. And I touched a bit upon the mimicry in Hutton's Vireos, um, looking like kinglets and the social dominance, well, you see that also in the tropics. There's a lot more examples in the tropics of this kind of mimicry. These two toucans are not very closely related to each other and they look incredibly similar. They differ in quite a bit in structure and their voices 
are very, very different, but they look like each other. And then I discovered at Cristalino that tooth-billed wrens mimic. Um, wrens have amazing voices. They do learn their songs, but it's not known that any other wrens will mimic. They, they seem to not, it's not part of their, their strategy in attracting mates and defending territories. Wrens have duets instead, which is a whole nother thing. I could talk on hours on duets. Um, but tooth-billed wren is a very aberrant wren. It's sort of the size of a house wren, a small thing. The only thing that's typical wren-like about it is that barred tail. Every wren has a barred tail and not many other birds have barred tails. So that's very wren-like about it. Um, genetics has shown that they are indeed wrens, but they live up in the canopy in these mixed flocks of tanagers and dacnuses and honey creepers and flycatchers and stuff. And they have a song type that's a simple trill. And then another song type that is just one thing after the next of all the other birds. Here's one song type, the trill. Not a very wren-like song. And they have a slow trill too that's common. You know there's a mixed flock in the canopy when you hear this. But sometimes when they're all alone, they'll, they'll do all these other things. Paradise Jackamar. All those with red billed pipe tanager in there. There, that's red billed pipe tanager. And it's thought that they need to be trying to do what drongos do. And drongos in the old world mimic other birds to try to assemble a big mixed flock. And then this takes me to the canopy towers at Madhu Wildlife Center, where you have an unparalleled view of the forest around. It's just fantastic. And this is where I've had the best views ever of this canopy singing thing, the Lawrence's thrush, which may be, in my opinion, the world's, not the world's best mimic, could be. It's also one of the most beautiful mimics. The way it delivers its song is, is one of the most haunting sounds in the rainforest. A study by Thomas Hardy published three years after Ted Parker's death, um, but he included Ted as his co-author because they had recorded a lot of the songs together. They documented over 170 species that were mimicked by some 30 thrushes that they analyzed. Um, they had one bird that mimicked over 50 species and gave 250 song phrases without stop. So it sang for nearly an hour on end. So, the last recording of this presentation will be this most amazing Lawrence's Thrush song. I hope you're able to hear that. So um, take a screen grab really quick if you want to make a note of these or ask me later, send me an email. I now use OSEN audio, it's like ocean audio without an A to analyze the bird songs I record here now. Um, Macaulay Library has been a great source for the sounds and I did not photograph all the birds that you saw. I got permission from all these people and thank them for it. And especially this. So if there's anything that this talk does for, for, for you and certainly does for me is it raises us so many questions. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody has any? Please feel free to unmute yourself or to type your question into the chat and Rich will get the, your questions answered. Hey Rich, I have a question about, about mimicry and you mentioned that sometimes it's on purpose. 
how, how do you know what's on purpose? What, what makes a mimic uh, purposeful? The, the, uh, the, the situation in which it's giving it, like the, the J's. Um, so, or if you're hearing it again and again and again, um, you know, the, a, a, a mockingbird, I'm sure knows that it's, it's singing, but I'm not sure it knows that when it sings a, a white-breasted nuthatch that it's doing a white-breasted nuthatch. There's evidence that, that birds do learn the sounds better if they, if they have seen it, um, the bird while they're mimicking, but they probably are just instinctually incorporating sounds they hear, and that's the kind of song that they sing. But it, I don't think the mockingbird is thinking, okay, I'm gonna do a red-shouldered hawk now, and now I'm gonna do a flicker, and now I'm gonna do white-breasted nuthatch. That's just the things that are in its vocabulary. It doesn't know how to sing any other way. Whereas the, the, the Canada J is, is totally silent. And then it decides because it sees a goshawk that it's going to mimic a goshawk. That's what I mean. Okay, thanks. Is it trying to, any idea if it's trying to, to say to the red tail or the goshawk, yes, we know you're there? Or has anybody ever studied? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, what happens next? That's, that's, my, that's, yeah, that's my theory. We know you're there, so don't even try to come eat us. They might also be trying to signal to other Canada Jays in the area. There's a goshawk over there. Watch out. Um, they're, they're, we know now there's tons of things about what, what birds are saying and their, and their vocalizations that are surprising us. Uh, we had, uh, in our backyard in Portland, we had a pair of Stellar Jays living in our backyard. And then we had a new puppy uh, move into the house behind us. And, and the puppy never stopped barking. And pretty soon the jays were barking. And I, I, at first I thought, what is that? And then I realized that the jays were mimicking the bark. And it just, it just seemed like they were having fun with sound. Yeah, that could also be, oh, definitely. I mean, we know birds love to have, have fun, especially corvids. Uh, ravens play a lot. There's a question here, what's the best type of recording hardware for a beginner who wants to record bird songs? Well, the sound files that you can get on with your phone these days is, is actually quite amazing. Um, it, it's a much better sound quality though if you can get an external microphone to go along with it. Um, so that's what I recommend. Um, the Olympus LS series of uh, PCM recorders are, are a big notch above that and they're small, easy to carry. They're a little more, a lot more expensive and they're just for recording sounds. I can't remember how much they are, like $200, $225. Um, and you can get a relatively cheap microphone to go into those as well. well that's interesting. I'm seeing some of the comments now. As long as I was talking, the sound was fine. That's interesting. Um, I have a comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Larry, and uh, uh, I'm enjoying your your uh, your fabulous uh, presentation here. Uh, have what have you done with uh, sub songs of jays and other birds? They're so hard to record because they're really quiet. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would I would love to get a good recording of one, and I I just didn't didn't take the time to, to download one from Macaulay. I mean, you can't download them from Macaulay Library, but I can ask, ask them there and they'll give me anything. Mm -hmm. And I may make my talk another 10 minutes longer and talk about sub songs. <laughs> right. Yeah, when you hear, a, you hear a Jay singing Scrub Jays will mimic in their sub songs. Yeah, they sound like a thrasher really in the yeah. sub songs. So. Um, and they're so quiet. It's not certain that they're actually communicating. It's like when I heard the purple finch mimicking the song. No, it's, 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 very, it's very personal. Yeah, yeah. Personal song. Mm -hmm. um, is there I, I was just interested if you done if you have uh, nope. done anything with that. Uh, so thanks. <clears throat> okay. Anyone else? Somebody else had something to say. Can you tell us more about social dominance theory, Rich, just a little bit? Maybe you can, Thomas. <laughs> you <want to? laughs> it's, it's really complex and, and it occurs in so many groups of birds. Uh, downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker are not closely related to each other at all. 
Um, they look like each other because one has evolved to look like the other. They may fit in, they may be avoiding um, being attacked. Like if a downy woodpecker looks like a hairy woodpecker, it may not be attacked or chased away um, by another woodpecker because they know that hairy woodpeckers are badasses. So looking like a hairy woodpecker uh, is a benefit you can squeeze in. Um, so it's thought that maybe the smaller one is mimicking the larger one, for example. Um, yeah. There's a really, there's a lot of examples of that in woodpeckers. Uh, the, the woodpeckers in South America um, related to um, pileated woodpecker, for example. Well, we had, we had one in this country as well, the, the ivory-billed woodpecker. Those are two different genera. But in Central and South America, you have examples of like pale-billed, I mean, we had ivory-billed, pale-billed woodpecker and lineated woodpecker, for example, are extremely similar birds. Um, but they show their closest relatives are actually in the old world. So the, the lineated woodpecker is more closely related to the great slaty woodpecker, for example, and the black woodpecker of Europe. And the pale-billed woodpecker is more closely related to the flamebacks of Southeast Asia than it is to the, the, the lineated. So um, there's obvious mimicry going on. And then there was this, this the helmeted woodpecker in, in Brazil was found not to be either of the genera, but this third genus called Celius, the ant-eating woodpeckers like chestnut-headed um, and wasn't related to them at all, even though it's striped, it doesn't look like any of the other Celius woodpeckers that looks like lineated woodpeckers, crazy. So there's three-way mimicry going on there. It's very complex. Okay. Rich, is a sub song the same thing as a whisper song? Yeah, I think those are both mean the same thing. A bird sits there very quietly and sort of babbles on and on and on and on. And it can be really hard to actually locate the bird. They often do it in a hidden location, dense in a bush or close mm -hmm. to the trunk. And if you listen very carefully or if you record it and tease apart the sonogram, you'll find that almost all of them are mimicry. Um, does that have anything to do with courtship? Um, it's, it seems like I hear Stellar Jays doing that, you know, very quiet song when two of them and when spring's coming around. I think of it as a March thing. I don't know. I don't know. The question that might, might be, but I've seen them do it when they're alone oh. and nobody, nobody can hear them. Mm -hmm. And they often seem to do it when they're very calm, comfortable, mm -hmm. relaxed, in a safe place. Mm -hmm. clues about in other words, around our bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> After a morning's feast. <laughs> well, everybody, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on how to improve this talk. Send me messages if you want. Um, other questions? Always change it around a little bit. Well, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. That's everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Really? That was just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot about birds. This Thanks. was a good week for bird sounds because we had Krudsma on Saturday at the uh, uh, Willamette Valley Bird Fest Symposium. And now you're you, I'm overloaded with bird sounds. It's great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry you weren't, weren't able to hear everything perfectly, but. Maybe I can give this talk again and not in person. A couple uh -huh. of years. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's so great to see everybody here tonight. Dennis, are you going to tell us about next month's program? Well, I did already, but I'll, I'll repeat okay. it. Bill Sullivan next month on the, uh, with the whatever the fourth Tuesday is in February. And uh, we're going to have um, Viera, uh, our own uh, local uh, birder, on the next month. So we're going to have lots of good speakers coming up. Well, and um, Rich, it, it's been wonderful to have you share your time and your amazing expertise with us. We, we truly appreciate it. Thank you.